Hello there everyone. In this module, we'll be going over the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. Let's begin with an introduction and the location. Cavernous sinuses are bilaterally paired collections of venous plexuses located on either side of the body of the sphenoid bone and cella tercica in the middle cranial fossa. The width of the sinus is 1 centimeter and extends 2 centimeters from the most posterior aspect of the orbit to the petrous part of the temporal bone. Each opens behind into the petrosal sinuses. The interior of the sinus is divided into several small spaces, or caverns, by means of trabeculae. Therefore, it is named the cavernous sinus. The floor of the sinus is formed by the endosteal layer of the dura mater, and the lateral wall, roof, and medial wall are formed by the meningeal layer. Next, let's go over relations. There are numerous structures surrounding the cavernous sinus that are noteworthy. Superiorly, the structures related are the optic chiasma, optic tract, internal carotid artery, and anterior perforated substance. Inferiorly is the foramen lacerum, the junction of the body, and the greater wing of the sphenoid. Medially, the structures present are the pituitary gland and the sphenoid air sinus. Laterally are the temporal lobe of the cerebral hemisphere and cavum trigeminale, containing the trigeminal ganglion. Anteriorly are the superior orbital fissure and apex of the orbit. Posteriorly are the crus cerebri of the midbrain and the apex of the petrous part of the temporal bone. The structures present in the lateral wall of the sinus from above downward are the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, the ophthalmic nerve, and the maxillary nerve. The structures that travel through the cavernous sinus are the abducens nerve, cavernous portion of the internal carotid artery, and the carotid plexus, or postganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers. Please note that the cavernous sinus is the only site in the body where an artery in this case, the internal carotid artery, passes completely through a venous structure. This is thought to allow for heat exchange between the warm arterial blood and cooler venous circulation. Now let's cover the tributaries of the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus receives blood via three sources, the orbit, the meninges, and the brain. From the orbit, the tributaries are the superior ophthalmic vein, the inferior ophthalmic vein, and sometimes the central vein of the retina. The tributaries from the meninges are the sphenoparietal sinus and anterior or frontal trunk of the middle meningeal vein. The tributaries from the brain are by means of the superficial middle cerebral vein and very few inferior cerebral veins. Now we'll go over the communications of the cavernous sinus. The transverse sinus via the superior petrosal sinus, the internal jugular vein or IJV via the inferior petrosal sinus, and the opposite cavernous sinus via the anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus. The pterygoid venous plexus via the emissary veins passing through the foramen ovale, spinosum, and lacerum the facial vein via the superior ophthalmic vein. Note that in all communications, blood can flow in either direction. The factors responsible for drainage of blood from the cavernous sinus are the expansile pulsation of the internal carotid artery or ICA within the sinuses, gravity, and the position of the head. Next we're going to learn about the special features of the cavernous sinus. It lies between the two layers of the dura mater. There is no muscle tissue in the wall. There is no valve. Hence, blood can flow in both directions. There is a cavernous or plexiform pattern interiorly. It's internally lined with endothelium, which is continuous with the veins. Now let's learn about cavernous sinus syndrome. Cavernous sinus syndrome is a medical emergency and life-threatening disorder 
that presents with different symptoms depending on what structure is affected. A severe lesion involving the entire sinus will present with total ophthalmoplegia due to cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6 injury, accompanied with fixed and dilated pupils due to compression of the superficial parasympathetic fibers of the cranial nerve 3. Cavernous sinus syndrome can lead to Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome occurs when the sympathetic plexus around the internal carotid is damaged. When the ophthalmic nerve and the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve are involved, the clinical manifestations are in the form of sensory loss in the face, scalp, maxilla, nasal cavity, sinuses, and palate. There are several causes of cavernous sinus syndrome, including metastatic tumor, meningioma, pituitary tumor, extension of nasopharyngeal tumors, granulomatous diseases, cavernous sinus thrombosis, and aneurysms of the cavernous part of the internal carotid artery. In case of rupture of a cavernous aneurysm, a carotid cavernous fistula is created leading to a pulsating exophthalmus on physical examination. Next, we're going to talk about cavernous sinus thrombosis. Starting with the etiology, cavernous sinus thrombosis, or CST, is a rare condition but is most commonly infectious in nature. It is mainly caused by the contiguous spread of infection, typically Staphylococcus aureus with about 55% of the cases from the paranasal sinuses, middle third of the face, dental abscesses, or orbital cellulitis, though this last one is less common. Other causes include cavernous sinus compression, for example, trauma or tumors. The least common causes are thrombophilia conditions, such as protein CS deficiency, oral contraceptive use, malignancy, and pregnancy. Plus, it is idiopathic in 25% of cases. Now for the clinical manifestations. The cavernous sinus drains the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins and the superficial cortical veins anteriorly. Cavernous sinus thrombosis from a septic etiology occurs due to embolization of bacteria, which trigger thrombosis that becomes trapped within the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus tends to trap more bacteria than other sinuses because it has more trabeculae that act like sieves to catch bacteria, and due to this, there will be subsequent reduction in venous drainage results in facial and periorbital edema, ptosis, proptosis, chemosis, painful eye movements, papilledema, retinal venous distension, and loss of vision. A headache is the most common symptom seen in 85% of cases. Focal neurological signs and or seizures may also occur. Isolated cranial nerve 3 palsy is thought to be an early manifestation. Thrombus can propagate into the dural system as the lack of valves in the dural sinus allow flow through emissary veins into and out of the cavernous sinus. Here's how diagnosis works. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is a clinical diagnosis. MRI with contrast is the imaging modality of choice to confirm its presence and to differentiate it from alternatives, such as orbital cellulitis, which may have a similar clinical presentation. Next is treatment. Management of cavernous sinus thrombosis is mainly done with the use of antimicrobials and antithrombotic agents. Lastly, let's learn about the complications. As the dural venous and cavernous systems are valveless, communication between dural sinuses and cerebral and emissary veins can lead to meningitis, dural empyema, or cerebral abscesses. Propagation of infection via the internal jugular vein can result in septic pulmonary emboli, pulmonary abscesses, pneumonia, or empyema. Compression of the internal carotid artery and pituitary gland may result in stroke and hypopituitarism, respectively. 
Thank you for listening to this module about cavernous sinus anatomy.